The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the warp, wolf, and weft of getting out of low Earth orbit and into the interstellar tapestry. Dragons in the air, dragons beneath our feet, dragons everywhere. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. This time on the podcast, we have an interview with Les Johnson. Les is a Bain author and anthology editor. He co-edited our great science fiction short story and science collection. It's got articles and stories in it. That's called Going Interstellar with Jack McDevitt. He is the co-author of science fiction novel Back to the Moon with Travis Taylor and of a great Mars mission thriller called Rescue Mode, which he wrote with Ben Bova. This summer, the sequel to Back to the Moon will be out. That one is called On to the Asteroid, and it's a thriller. Um, It's about an asteroid that threatens Earth. And that one is by Les and Travis also. Les is a scientist and has several nonfiction books out there, as well as many science and space-related essays and articles in the Bain Free nonfiction anthologies you can find in Bain eBooks. In his day job, Les is a scientist at NASA, although, as he often emphasizes, his opinions expressed here and elsewhere are his own. Right now, Les has a new nonfiction article on the Bain.com website, front page, This is Mars, Moon, or Bust, and it is a call for space advocates out there to get over their petty differences and concentrate on a unified goal, and Les offers several ways to rationally determine what that goal should be. All of that is coming up. And also, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now here's the news. The new April E-Arcs are out. Now, an E-Arc is a mythological creature similar to a wyvern, which inhabits the Vanderwall's belts of a planet and it swoops down to gobble up the occasional knight or princess. No, that's not what an E-Arc is. What is an E-Arc, Christopher? An E-Arc is an advanced reader copy available for download on Bane.com. Um, what's so special about them? Well, what's cool about the E-Arcs, right, is that if you can't wait for a book to come out, you don't have to, at least not with us. You can grab them usually a few months in advance of their actual release date, as long as you're willing to put up with a few typos here and there. Usually they are already copy edited, but not proofread, so yes. they're, they're in pretty good condition. And you get them early. All right, so out now in e form is The Dragon Hammer, by yours truly, Tony Daniel. This is a young adult high fantasy, and I think it's one of the best things I've ever written. And I really think you'll like it if you like fantasy and adventure and dragons and heroism and bravery and love stories and gritty battle scenes. And um, maybe I should throw in spaceships so you'll read it, Christopher. Well, that would help. (laughs) No, (laughs) fantasy's cool, too. I got spaceship books out there. The protagonist in The Dragon Hammer is 16, but I definitely think adults will enjoy the story. Uh, I did tailor it for young adults, especially, though. And I think any 14-year-old kid uh, or older, maybe an advanced 12-year-old even, will enjoy the book. I read it to my 12-year-old daughter, or should I say I workshopped it with her, and took many of her suggestions for revision. Christopher, do you happen to have the backflack copy that you've been proofreading on that? Uh, oh, we're somewhere. We're passing the cover around, proofreading the back cover now. Oh, somewhere. Let me see. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> Evil from the dawn of time is on the verge of domination, but Wolf von Dunstig figured none of that mattered to him. What could he do about it? After all, he was basically nobody, the 16-year-old third son of a duke destined for an uneventful life as a ranger. But when destiny comes calling, it turns out there is only Wolf to answer. After a devastating invasion of his native land, Wolf must rally the peaceful valley of Shenandoah. He must free his family and his land from the grip of intruders controlled by vampiric evil. It's time to grow up. It's time to fight for what is right. It's time to wield the dragon hammer. 
the the reason that it, the kingdom is called Shenandoah in the book is because this is an alternate this is an alternate history where the Vikings came and stayed and uh, have been settled in the in the American in the North American continent for for over a thousand years no, now. Finland. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so all the the eastern seaboard is divided up into little kingdoms and such. Um, so, and it's got magic and stuff as well. And I, you know, I'm real influenced by C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Madeline Langle and stuff like that. So I think it's, uh, it's a, it's a good thing. Onward. Uh, what else do we have, Christopher? Well, also out now in EARC form is the year's best military and adventure science fiction 2015. This is a great collection edited by David F. Sharad, who often hosts the Bain Free Radio Hour when we are talking about short story collections. Yeah, well, this is uh, the second time we've done this year's best, and last year's edition got all kinds of attention, and the sales were just fine as well. As I understand it, David reads everything, really all professionally published science fiction short stories that are in print and online, and picks out the best. That's right, and Tony and I go over his final selection with him and help him, Tony Weisskopf and me, uh, and help him weed it down. This one has great stories by David Drake, Brendan Dubois, Brad R. Torgerson, Hank Davis, here in the office, Hank, uh, also author of many uh, short stories, David Bren, and many others. Sounds like a great collection. You can vote on the best story in it this year, just like the last year, too. The winning author will receive $500 and a plaque at Dragon Con this year. So it's a great way to reward the author of your pick for best story in the anthology. The voting website is listed in the front matter of the eARC. And for Leaden Universe fans, hey, it's finally here. Alliance of Equals eARC by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller is now available. Um, beset by the angry remains of the Department of the Interior, challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Surebleak, and somewhat low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, Sean Yoskalen aboard Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with um, other loops. Traveling with Dutiful Passage on this unsettling journey is Paddy Yosgalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Paddy is eager to make up for lost time due to Corval's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior. She is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. Obviously, this is another great entry in the Leaden universe, the Space Adventure Extraordinaire series, also available only at Bane Books in eArt form until July, when the book comes out. The Dragon Hammer, Book One of Wolf Saga by Tony Daniel, the year's best military and adventure science fiction 2015 eARC, edited by David F. Sharad and Alliance of Equals eARC by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller are all available and only available at BaneEbooks.com. want to welcome Les Johnson to the podcast. Hey, Les. Hey, Tony. Les Johnson is a Bain science fiction author, popular science writer, and NASA technologist. He has science fiction novels set in three of the destinations we're about to discuss. Rescue Mode, which is a novel uh, he wrote with Ben Bova. It involves Mars. And uh, Travis Taylor and Les have written... Back to the Moon, and the upcoming sequel to that, which is On to the Asteroid, that's going to be out this summer. Uh, Les has a nonfiction book pertinent to our discussion, Harvesting Space for a Greener Earth. And right now at Bain.com, Les Johnson is the author of a new article titled Mars, Moon, or Bust. And it's all about how the space advocates out there need to get their act together. Les, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and, and what your areas of research are and, and things like that, just for those that don't know? Sure. And how come you're writing science fiction? <laughs> well, first off, I'm a physicist, and the reason I'm a physicist is, is due to two things. One is being seven years old and just having my uh, socks knocked off, probably my pajamas. I was in my pajamas watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon when I was seven. And then shortly after that, my sister introduced me to science fiction. 
uh, probably, I don't know, I may have been 12 at the time, was giving me what uh, a Perry Roden novel. I don't know if any of your listeners are familiar with the old <laughs> I'm sure they are. English translation that Forey Ackerman did, but it was Realm of the Triplanets, and, and I remember that as vividly as yesterday, and it just took me. So I knew that at that point that I wanted to do something connected with space and space travel, and to do that you had to be a scientist, of course. So I uh, started studying physics. That led me to uh, get my bachelor's and master's degree in physics, and ultimately I came to NASA 26 years ago this month, actually. So this is my 26th year working for NASA. And uh, while there, I've been in several different projects. Most of my focus is on advanced propulsion, and so I'm uh, leading an asteroid mission that will fly in 2018 that's going to use a uh, propulsion technology called a solar sail, and we'll be using sunlight reflected from the sail as our propulsion system. I've also worked on electrodynamic tethers, which are basically uh, using electrical currents and magnetic fields in planetary magnetospheres and ionospheres to derive thrust. And I'm also uh, pretty actively involved in trying to understand how we might go to the stars someday. Off and on in my career, I've been involved in studies of human missions to various destinations like the moon, to Mars, looking at human missions to asteroids, and just uh, all around space geek and cadet, I guess, is is the bottom line. You're the you're, you're the lead technologist, right, on the uh, on this attempt to solar sail a, a little satellite to an asteroid. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm with, in NASA parlance. That's called the uh, solar sail principal investigator, and uh, I'm responsible uh, for making sure that the sail works as advertised, and we actually take our little spacecraft to the asteroid using using sunlight and making sure the sail does what it's supposed to do. What, just uh, before we get into it, what are solar sails made of? Well, that, you know, that, that's an interesting question. It, it, the materials uh, could be varied, but the one we're using is a polyimide. It's a plastic and it's coated with aluminum and it's really, really thin and fairly strong plastic. It's called CP1. It's a proprietary formulation of the company that makes it which is a company called Nexolve, and it's really thin. It's about two and a half microns thick, which is thinner than a hair. Uh, fairly strong. You can damage it if you really try, but just by handling it, you won't, and it'll last a long time in space. And to make it reflective, we put an aluminum coating on it, which is about 93% reflective in the visible spectrum. So when we're exposed to sunlight, um, all those visible light photons are going to bounce off of the sail, just like ping pong balls, or, or uh, rubber balls bouncing off a door, and as they bounce off of it, the uh, the light doesn't have any rest mass, but it has momentum, just like those balls bouncing off the door. And as the photons bounce off, they're going to push the sail in the other direction. It's it's a small push. It's like really small push. Like imagine a football field, and the force is the equivalent to like a quarter mm -hmm. <laughs> um, would weigh across that whole you know football field of area. But when you're in space and you don't have atmosphere and no gravity around you and no gravity field, you're going to move, and that's how we, we get our thrust. Cool. And you um, uh, you were just telling me about how you have been to the uh, SPAR conference. Is that Well, um, yeah, I was uh, very uh, honored, actually, because it was an invitation-only event to be invited to uh, Stanford University last weekend where there was uh, a meeting called Breakthrough Discuss. And it was uh, sponsored by the uh, Breakthrough Initiatives Foundation. And this is uh, the, the, uh, a philanthropic organization funded by uh, some philanthropists in the Silicon Valley area that are really trying to make a difference in the future of space exploration and our understanding of the universe. And they have funded uh, something called Breakthrough Listen, which is putting a lot of money, I'm not sure the exact amount, but I've heard tens of millions or more uh, to fund SETI research, and uh, listeners may have heard of the Breakthrough Starshot, which was just announced about a week ago, that involves uh, Yuri Milner, the, uh, the one of the principal backers for that, Stephen Hawking and others, where they want to build these really high power lasers and quickly accelerate uh, computer chip sized spacecraft with little sails like a solar sail, only a laser sail to an appreciable fraction of the speed of light and just send hundreds if not thousands of these things out into space and have them travel really quickly to another star and send back data from the star. And this was kind of a, a technical kickoff discussion 
of that were a group of experts from around the country and various technologies associated with that got together to talk about it and put forth ideas of how that might how that might be done. There's money behind it and research, and people are, uh, <laughs> or at least uh, in the initial stages of thinking about it, right? And... Well, yeah, I'm not a spokesman for that group at all. I was just an invited yeah. participant in the discussion. But it's my understanding that the uh, Breakthrough Initiatives Foundation is, is is going to be funding a lot of work in that area. And, you know, it's, it's a very daunting technical challenge, but uh, they've got some of the smartest people in the country working on it. The, 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 the list of people in attendance at this meeting was like a, you know, who's who of space. And I, I had a total geek out moment, I guess, while I was there to, to be among that group. And it was uh, pr pretty awesome. Now, how they're going to do it, I don't know. I know the general idea, but, you know, no one has built lasers this powerful. No one has built spacecraft this small. How do you keep it alive? Can it, you know, survive the distance to Alpha Centauri? Can it send back data? How is it going to send back data? Those are all questions that they have to answer, and I think that's what they're going to try to tackle. It's a, it's a long shot, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad that somebody's rolling the dice and taking on the challenge. Yeah. Oh, you know, we forgot to mention that you're also the founder and uh, one of the chief uh, architects of the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, which happens uh, yearly. Yeah, the TVIW is a is a nonprofit educational corporation uh, uh, founded in Tennessee, and there are a group of us that that, that started it. Um, our goal is to try to get the uh, public, not just technical people, although the majority are technical. But at the last meeting, and thanks to the very gracious support of Bain Books, we had science fiction writers there, and Bain's been a really good sponsor to the to the workshop. We had about a hundred people actually focus for three days on the topics of going to the stars. We had the uh, principal behind this breakthrough star shot, Dr. Uh, Philip Lubin, who before we knew about the star shot, talked about it, gave us a talk at the uh, workshop about what that whole concept looks like and uh, had uh, not only a lot of fun, but we actually have some technical products, some technical papers and some original research that comes out of our meetings that'll be, uh, that'll be published. So. If anybody's interested, uh, go to our website, uh, www.tviw, stands for Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, and .us, and uh, check us out. And our next meeting will be in October of 2017 here in Huntsville, Alabama, celebrating the anniversary of the launch of Sputnik, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, let's talk about your article. In Mars, Moon, or Bust, you lay out where we are, that is, the United States at the moment, for the most part, with space exploration and development and the possibilities of where we are going. But first, there's a bit of an indictment that you deliver. You say, this is a travesty. What is this, and what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, first off, I better make very clear that I'm, I'm speaking as Les Johnson, science fiction writer and private citizen, not representing my employer, who are NASA. And uh, the, the opinions are just my own. Mm -hmm. But it, what, what's said is that if you look at the World Space Agencies to begin with, and, and NASA in particular, we're focused on right now going to Mars. <laughs> and as an interim step, there's the asteroid redirect mission, which will have us uh, sending people to an asteroid to investigate that asteroid with a long-term vision in the 2030s of sending people to Mars. And then you stick your head up out of the American space program and you look around at what the rest of the world is doing, and the Europeans and the Chinese are all talking about sending people to the moon. And we've been to the moon, of course, decades ago, but they were talking about going to the moon. And, and you look around, there are groups advocating going to asteroids, first with robots and then with people. Um, and, it, it's, and then within the U.S., as we approach this presidential, well, the travesty is that we haven't been beyond low Earth orbit since Apollo in, in, in the 1970s. Uh, we've done some great things. Our space station has produced fantastic science and, and technology. But, you know, that promise, that dream that we all had of what would happen after Apollo and expanding the human presence beyond Earth orbit hasn't happened. So to answer your question, instead of just pontificating, the travesty is that we haven't done that yet. We haven't been beyond space station with people since Apollo. And, and that's just, that's terrible. And I think part of the reason for that is we can't get the whole community behind a destination with sufficient numbers and enthusiasm to maintain continuity 
continuity of political will to make it happen. Can you sort of sketch the public space advocacy organizations and the areas that, um, what is the situation right now? Well, and, and I don't want to presume to speak for these organizations, so I tried to pull from their official statements and their, their policy statements that they have on, on their websites. So if you're a member of one of these organizations and you think I'm mischaracterizing, I, I'm going to apologize in advance and ask you to go check out your, 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 your website because um, my experience has been that, um, the, that, that what you post on the website is, corresponds to kind of where the efforts go for these organizations. So if you, if you want to look at, at the groups that are out there, there's the Mars Society, which obviously by its name is advocating, you know, sending people directly to Mars. They've been out there and active for several years and make some pretty compelling arguments that, you know, Mars is, is the place to go and have even come up with their own architectures for that. And, and there are a few of us in the space community that would argue against, you know, eventually sending people to Mars, but is that the right destination to leap for right now, you know, which is really the question. And, and they're not the only organization. They are a, more of a grassroots popular organization with some space professionals as a part of it. And then you have Explore Mars. And I went to one of their meetings last year, and it is it is probably a bit more um, mainstream space organizations, very highly technical, and their goal is 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 Mars exploration, and and you know make it happen. Uh, but then you turn around and you have the Artemis Society and the Moon Society, which are saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, go out and look at a clear night, and the destination is obvious. It's close. We've been there. We know we can do it. We need to take a more incremental approach. Let's go back to the moon, and here's why. And, you know, they lay out their arguments, which are fairly compelling also, as to why it's something within the constrained budget that we could do and gets people beyond Earth orbit and what we can learn on the moon. And it's hard to argue with that. And then you get into some of these other groups like the, um, uh, you know, the, the Space Frontier Foundation, Space Foundation, Planetary Society, which is more focused on robotic than, than human stuff, National Space Society, they're, they're generally advocating for human exploration beyond LEO, and their emphasis shifts from topic to topic, but they're not solidly behind one, you know, destination or, or the other. Um, so within that context, you know, they're all advocating for what they want to do, and that's great, you know, because in the United States we, we love – the competition of ideas, but but my statement is once we've picked where we're going to go, it takes more than just one or two presidential terms to make it happen, and we need to stay focused, and that's where we've fallen yeah. short. You make a really compelling argument about why Apollo, the Apollo program, sort of turned into a one-off. Nobody back then seemed to think it would happen. Everybody thought we'd be settling the planets, or a lot of people did. Um, what happened? Well, I wish I, I wish I knew the real answer to that. Not having been a part of the decision process and only looking at that in the historical context, I've heard lots of lots of answers to that, Tony. I've heard, you know, this was the time of the Vietnam War and we were spending a lot of money on space and the war was expensive. And, you know, I hear those arguments, but in terms of what space costs versus everything else, that doesn't really hold water. Well, you make a really good argument that it, why it was exceptional, which is that, um, that, you know, it was a feeling that we have to carry out this vision that the, that our assassinated, uh, martyred president wanted. And it, and it was able to carry over several terms of, uh, the presidency, right? Absolutely. It was to honor a popular president who had a compelling vision at the middle of a global competition of economic and political systems, the, you know, us versus the Soviets and, you know, capitalism, democracy versus uh, communism and dictatorships. And, and so all of the magic sauce was there that, that enabled that to happen. And I think the public kind of viewed it as honoring President Kennedy's legacy. So, but, you know, after we did it and public interest started waning, and, and I personal opinion is that the risks of losing a mission were there throughout, and we hadn't really lost any people, although we came darn close on Apollo 13, you know, combining all those factors with, you know, my own personal pet theory, which is Nixon just didn't really want to continue honoring Kennedy because, of course, who beat Nixon in the presidential election of 1960? That was, that was China. 
Kennedy, just put it all together to terminate it. And and that was that's that's the big travesty because you know, Von Brown well you may not know this, but Von Brown laid out a pretty solid plan for consistent improvements to the Saturn V and developing a nuclear thermal upper stage which would, would be used to take us to Mars. He had us uh, flying by Venus with people in the 1970s in his plan and a Mars landing in the 1980s. And then all of that was just cast aside and put on a, on a shelf. And that's kind of the, you know, the stasis of low Earth orbit. We got the shuttle, which was a great vehicle. We did a lot of science and learned a lot from it. Led to the space station, which has also been, uh, in my opinion, a worthwhile investment and a good thing. But it hasn't, it hadn't enabled that thing we all want, which is, you know, I want my moon base. I'd like to see hotels in orbit. I'd like to see us mining asteroids, and I'd like to see see us exploring Mars. And we don't seem to be any closer to that today than we were 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So we need to rec we need to recreate some sort of perfect storm like Apollo, although it won't be the same thing. Um, but we have to decide on something to start with. What's the deal with Mars? Well, and, and deciding on things is, 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 I think, absolutely critical. And even, even more than that is once it's decided on, we need to stick with it. And, and in the space community, we tend to break this down into us versus them, and we end up using those arguments against each other, and then the people who are critical of space development pick up on that and end up using our own arguments against all of us. And, and so, you know, when you ask the question, what about Mars, you know, Hey, I wrote a book about exploring Mars about the with Ben and, and, and the dream of you know, footprints on another planet. I mean, who hasn't looked at those wonderful photographs and data we're getting back from the rovers and just imagine, you know, what that view would be like if you're standing there yourself. I mean, I get goosebumps just, just talking about it. And what's so sad is is I know that technically, if someone were to come with the resources and say we've got to go now, we could go. Is, is outside of the current uh, budget for uh, for a, 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 the U.S. space agency to do, but it could be done in collaboration with others. It could be done in a private-public partnership. NASA has plans to do it in the future and is knocking off the technical challenges to get there eventually. But, you know, if you look back 10 years ago, uh, we were thinking we were going back to the moon with Project Constellation under the former President Bush. And... Things change, and it changed, and we went from the moon to Mars, and that would be great. Can we sustain the political will to do that over the next 10 to 20 years? Basically, in your article, you you do, you do lay out the different options and, and what the pluses and minuses of them very carefully. What are the other things that, that can be done? Um, there's the moon, there's asteroids, and there's a solar satellite array you also bring in as well. What about the moon? Well, yeah. Um, it, it has gravity. It's a heck of a lot closer than Mars. Um, it has some resources. It, it does. And, and the most important thing uh, that the moon would do for us is, is teach us how to live and work in space in a way that's not that far from home so that if something goes wrong, help is nearby and you can get home quickly. And um, as, as we are taking those steps beyond Earth and Earth orbit, be risky. And if something fails, do, do you want to be three days away from home or do you want to be nine months to a year away from home? And that's one of the most compelling arguments for the moon, in, in my opinion, as a stepping stone. And then there's a lot of science to be gained from the moon, as well as potential use of lunar resources to help build some of the other things I talk about, which are space solar power stations and otherwise. So, you know, I can see the argument for the moon. Um, and it's, it's as exciting to me as going to Mars, but it's 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 not going to be that thing that makes us a truly interplanetary species, but it is closer and it is a stepping stone. Yeah. And, and then you, you look at the other destination. Oh, go ahead. If you have a question about the moon, or I can just go on and talk about the asteroid thing. Well, let's, um, let's lay it all out there and then talk about each one a little more. So, you know, asteroids, uh, that, that is something that NASA has plans to do. And there are various private companies and now other governments, Luxembourg and others, that are talking about mining asteroids. You know, every element and resource pretty much that we have here on the planet is available out in space just for the taking within whatever context of international law ends up governing all this. But, you know, so there's a, there's a pretty compelling case for flying to an asteroid, 
seeing what resources are there and perhaps mining those resources either to support an Earth orbital industrial infrastructure, resurfacing, uh, re repairing and servicing and refueling very expensive satellites in geostationary orbit, keeping them operational longer, or mining them for, for pretty rare materials and sending them back to Earth, dropping them in the desert and going to recover them and using them in industry, or mining them and using those resources to build an industrial base in low Earth orbit that feeds this nascent commercial industry that we're seeing happen to sustain them as they move further and further out, taking tourists and, and hopefully go out on, on money-making ventures. So, you know, I can see the benefit of going to asteroids and exploring them. And then lastly, although this community hasn't been as vocal in the last, you know, over it's, it's come and gone over various decades, this whole notion of using space resources, uh, sunlight, to build space solar power stations and help solve some of the climate change problems we have here on the planet by providing, you know, high-power, continuous electrical power to the grid from satellites in mm -hmm. Earth orbit. So basically you collect sun and you, you beam it down in, in as microwaves or in a waveform electromagnetically and collect it on the – how does it work, those things? Well, that's, yeah, that's exactly what the idea is. And, and the beauty of this is you don't have the, the problem of weather here in Huntsville – Today, it's a cloudy, rainy day, which would not be a very good day for a big solar farm to be generating power. And if you're out in space, especially if you're in geosynchronous orbit, which is pretty far out, you pretty much can be always in sunshine and uh, always able to have sunlight power generating on your solar arrays. And if you put really big solar panels out, which you can do in space because you don't have gravity, so they don't have to have all that structural mass, they can be very lightweight, you could make a lot of electricity, uh, megawatts or gigawatts, and then beam it down to the Earth with either microwaves, which we can do very efficiently, very high efficiency, you know, 90% conversion efficiency. It's really amazing. Or high-power lasers that are tuned to go through the atmosphere to some receiving station on the ground, which then distributes the power to the grid. And there's just, I mean, this is <clears throat> this is a huge amount of energy. It's not. We're not talking about the 4% of renewables we have now. This could basically uh, take a huge part of the of the energy needs of humanity, right? It, it could in the future if you put up a whole, whole network of these power stations. You sure could. And, and the benefit from that is that you're not burning the fossil fuels. It is plentiful and it's always on. The sun will be a good, good power source for the next billion or more years, so I don't think we have to worry about that. And it could start offsetting some of the, the problems that we're having on the ground. I come from East Kentucky, you know, where coal is king. I hate to see strip mining and the coal mines and what that does to the environment. Uh, you look at other sources and, you know, we're all really happy now that we're getting all this oil and natural gas, but Oklahoma is now having earthquakes from the, the, the fracking. There are environmental groups concerned about that. I don't want to get into the whole fracking yes or no debate, but it, 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 anything we do has environmental consequences. And if you do the trade, which I've done, the environmental consequences for a space-based solar power network are small and very localized in comparison to a lot of these other energy sources. And these other energy sources are awesome. Things like wind power. I just drove past a windmill farm in Northern California this past week. Pretty awesome. But that's niche power. It's, it's going to help on the edges of the grid. What you need is you need high-density power to sustain the grid. And one option for space is just forget the moon, forget Mars, forget asteroids, and let's use uh, space, ex space development funding to go build a space solar power infrastructure and solve some of our energy and environment problems first and then expand the human presence outward. And I can see the appeal of that. My problem is I look at all these groups and I want to be a member of all of them because <laughs> yeah. um, I think we ought to be doing all of that, but we don't have the resources to do all of that, and therein lies the, the problem. Well, what is – all right, back to Mars. What it, Besides just the, the utter coolness factor, what else would, uh, would, would make Mars our destination instead of the moon our destination or something else? The... Well, well, you know – well, I keep saying you know, and people may not know, so I need to break the habit of saying that. But Mars is about science. Did it have life? Could it sustain life in the future? And just the knowledge we would gain 
from studying in detail a planet that is other than the Earth. Because when we look at all of our knowledge of planetary science, until Voyager, really, and, and more so now some of the rovers and our, our human explorations, we had no, very little data to compare our planet to other planets. And as you learn more and more about how other planets work and their interactions and their ecologies without life, ecology is not the right word, their environment, it, it advances science and our understanding of our own world. And given that Mars shares such a history with ours, I think one of the most compelling cases for going to Mars is to have field ge geologists on the ground exploring, to have people looking in the right places and digging deep to look for the signs of possible ancient life, understand the planetary processes, and figure out what it would take to expand humanity to another home and solve the problem. I believe it was Arthur C. Clarke talked about, you know, getting out of the cradle. And by golly, we got to get out of the cradle. And the moon is, is nice, but it's not ever, in my opinion, going to be as hospitable to long-term survival of humans as Mars might be. So if we want a really stepping stone way to expand a human presence in a survivable, meaningful way beyond Earth, Mars is the obvious destination. Right. Mars has an atmosphere, however thin, um, and it could be terraformed in some manner, perhaps. And it, 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 because of that thin atmosphere and because of its similarity to Earth in the sense of, of the, nearly the same you know, 24-hour day that Ireland's buckle is about the same, granted it's a lot colder, it makes a, a, a warm day in Antarctica, you know, would be a blistering hot day. <laughs> a cold day in Antarctica is a blistering hot day on Mars. But it's, it still has the potential for being terraformed. It has the potential for being adapted, perhaps under some of these dome city ideas that people have talked about or, or otherwise. You, you can make fuel and processes from the methane atmosphere. We can do chemistry there. There's a lot of things you can do in an atmosphere that you can't do on the moon, which doesn't have an atmosphere. It, it makes uh, thermal management of your power plants easier. It just helps with everything to be living in an environment that's more similar to the Earth. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's really compelling from the long-term view. If I'm taking a long view of human exploration, Mars has to be a part of it. And the moon um, has some resources, right? Yes, it does. Uh, the moon probably has accessible water, although we don't know that for sure. We know there's water there, but the amounts and its accessibility are still to be determined. There are some missions planned to answer that question. Uh, it's entirely likely that in those permanently shadowed craters at the lunar south pole that there are probably crashed comets, big chunks of ice in there that we could get to and use to get water. And once you have water, you have hydrogen and oxygen, which means you can make fuel cells, not only that you can use it for industrial processes you can use it for people to drink so there is a sustainability path for people there uh, there are mining resources there the moon's a lot of silicon what do we make solar panels out of the, the moon society and others see the benefit of basically making the moon for its 14 day day you know a big solar collector and maybe beam power back from there either back to the earth or the earth industrial capability in earth orbit so well, there, there are a lot of reasons to go to the moon, but it's also, to me, a compelling case of keeping the eye on Mars and learning how to live and work on the moon first, because it's closer, mm. is, is one of the arguments. And it has some of the coolness factor of going to another planet um, that you get with Mars as well. It's Oh, absolutely. You're standing and, on something. And, and you, know, you know, Tony, almost... Well, I won't say almost. I'll say all these destinations have the coolness factor. Mm -hmm. But that's not enough to get people to, to pony up and say that's where we need to go. Typically, you've got to have a have a statement of what we're going to get from it. And, and our culture today, and I didn't write about this in the article, and now that I think about it, I probably should or should propose another article. And that is that we tend to focus our research and development these days based on what the return on investment, the ROI, and how long it will take us to get something back from it. And I would argue that post-World War II up until the 80s, that was not as much of a factor. And I don't think that was as much of a factor in Apollo. I think at that time, investments in science and technology, particularly science, were more focused on, let's understand nature better. Let's see what we learn. And I'm sure something of good will come out of this sometime, somewhere. 
But don't you think a lot of the utilitarian arguments are are defensive by space advocates? So, like, because they've been so pounded by why do any of this? Why don't we, you know, solve our problems here first? And they need to come up with some answers that that um, because people that make these arguments just don't feel the sense of wonder apparently that the rest that that us the rest of us do. Um, I don't know. I, I I'm less inclined to. Um, to blame those who use those arguments as much as um, feel pity for them because that's the that's where they've been driven to. But anyway, that's that's just to throw that out there. And so, what about the asteroids? Um, speaking of return on investment, well, if you're if you're looking for an ROI, there there are, and I can I can mention these two companies that I'm aware of: uh, Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries. They, they are looking at the resources that are there and potentially tapping into an, a new market that's much closer term than people in space would be. And that is that, that there are a lot of very, very expensive satellites, billion-dollar class satellites, making a lot of money for the companies that own them in Earth geosynchronous orbit, really high orbit. And those satellites last decades – but they still have to use fuel to maneuver to stay in position where they are. And they are, they are the satellites that give us much of our telecommunications revolution. Cable TV, a lot of satellite data transmission, secure satellite link for, for data and financial transactions and all sorts of things. And, and these big birds, when they fail, they have to be replaced, and that's a, that's a huge upfront cost. If these satellites were made to be repairable or refuelable, think about how the astronauts did when they repaired the Hubble Space Telescope, but now you could do that robotically. And instead of spending tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to launch all that propellant from Earth to refuel these things, what if you had a way to take a little robot that you launch and extract water ice from a comet and just go and tank up these satellites and after you top off the tank and extend your lifetime by five to ten years, saving somebody multiple billions of dollars who will pay you to do that, you go fill up again and go do it for another customer, right? Mm -hmm. But there may be a market in the near term which gives an ROI for robotic asteroid mining, and it's just a step beyond robotic to see people out there overseeing these operations because there's nothing better than people to fix machines when they inevitably break. Somebody's got to be there to kick the tire, right? And so, I, you know, I can see the argument for, for that because that's something that could be a near-term return on investment for private business. And part of our space exploration charter by governments in general is to do the upfront research and development to enable industry and commerce and people to follow. So, you know, working some of the technologies to, to explore asteroids is, is a great idea. And what is um, what's the science? Uh, what is the what's cool about asteroids? Well, as speaking, you know, I'm still not speaking for NASA, but I am the Solar Sail principal investigator for the NEA Scout. We have a camera on board on the Near Earth Asteroid Scout, and and we're going to be studying the, the asteroid, trying to understand basically what is it made out of. We're going to better understand uh, its history and what asteroids of its size class, which is under 100 meters in length. This is a fairly small asteroid. But, you know, the question of is it a single rock? Is it multiple rocks that are loosely bound gravitationally? Does it have a cloud of dust circling it? Or has sunlight pressure washed all that away? What's its impact history, which will tell us more about the evolution of the inner solar system and when all these, uh, uh, these small rocks and things were banging into each other, making bigger rocks, so it really is, is another data point in understanding the neighborhood, our neighborhood being the inner solar system that we on Earth live in and occasionally interact with, the Chebolinsk meteorite, the Tunguska impactor. We, we need to be aware of what this neighborhood is like and what to do with it, not just for planetary defense, but for science and for those resources. So the science missions are to better understand what's out there. It would be like... You know, hey, what's beyond that valley? Is, are there resources there we can use? How easy are they to access? Until we go look, we don't know. If there are um, human visitors after the robots, 
you can't you can't stand on an asteroid, right? I mean, most of them. How do you get around on them? What would you do when you're there if you were a miner on an asteroid? Well, most of you know, flying flying around an asteroid is going to be like a docking maneuver for most of these asteroids because the gravity is so small. You, you you jump off the asteroid, you're not going to fall back down. You know, you're going to keep going. <laughs> off of most of these. So it would be like a docking or a rendezvous maneuver. And there are various systems that have been proposed for almost like rock climbing. Uh, I was recently, after this meeting at Stanford, I went up to my first time ever visit to Yosemite. And uh, there were, we talked to some climbers who were getting ready to go climb the rock faces there. And I envision maneuvering and attaching yourself to an asteroid and if you read the book Travis and I wrote, you'll, you'll hear more about this uh, with Onto the Asteroid, is that it's, it can be a lot like rock climbing and, and learning to work in that environment. And if you're going to put a chemical plant there, you have to find some way to attach it to the rock so it won't float away. And if it's a big enough asteroid, of course, you do have some gravity, and you can do a landing and there'll be enough gravity to keep you there, but you still would be bouncing much higher than you do on the moon because the gravity would be substantially less. So, all right, arriving at a common goal, how are we going to do this? Um, how do we figure out what to do in a way that can, that we can become the spacefaring civilization sooner rather than later, or maybe sooner before, and then save ourselves before we destroy ourselves here? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I wish I knew. I, I put forth some ideas in the essay and I left open intentionally the last idea for other people to come tell me what those ideas are because I, I ran out of them at that point. I, I think there are various options. One is that uh, either the, the space community can get together on their own and have some kind of a study group where all the major organizations say, hey, we've got to get our act together and come up with a plan we can all live with and go into a room with all the technical data and the people who look at return on investment and the scientists and haggle it out over a period of time and come up with some position paper or plan that may not give each group what it wants, but each group can support because it meets our, all of us have the larger goal of sending people beyond low Earth orbit, period. If you look at all of these groups, and I think I can say that uniformly, that goal is there. The disagreement is not getting people beyond LEO, it's where do they go. And if we can get each of these groups to put aside their particular destination and get into a room and agree on a destination and then a schedule or a timeline that leads to their pet destination getting selected in the future, and we make this the primary goal that's advocated in the political process, I think it would, it would be a win-win all around. Absent that, another option is that's done, but it's done at the behest of the government or a collection of governments. That's a possibility, and it'd be convened and run and organized that way, and it comes out. And I can hear the private space advocates saying, why are you talking about governments? And, and I think that's another, that's another thing I want to touch on before we end this interview today. But in, in terms of the list of options that go down here, another option is we can just keep doing what we're doing. And basically advocate for what we want to advocate for and go talk to our leaders and push for what we want to push for and whoever wins, wins. And just mm -hmm. keep your fingers crossed that it doesn't reset every election cycle when somebody else wins. And, and that clearly hasn't worked. So I'm not a big advocate of, of that approach. Well, one thing you talk about is creating a sort of dialectic that sort of feeds, like having one solution that one party in America would, if you're talking about the United States, would take up and one that the other would take up. But both parties would then, of our major parties, would then have something it was advocating. Yeah, and that's a dangerous path to go on. Uh, it, it, and I'm not sure I'm really advocating that one. It's one option. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the wonderful things about space that has been enjoyed by NASA and space industry in general is pretty significant uh, support from all parts of the political spectrum. And I, I really don't want to see space exploration become, or a particular destination become associated with one political party or one political mm. ideology. So that was more of a, a, a warning than a, <laughs> that you were giving. This could happen, is it, what you were saying, if we don't watch out. It's certainly an option. 
but it's not what I would advocate. I, I, I don't want to go down that path. I, I think we need to, to to realize that there is support for space development that crosses the political spectrum, and I, I know that personally because I have, you know, where anybody who's on Facebook knows that people are opinionated, and, and you get all these, you know, really horrible, strongly worded posts one way or the other. Mm-hmm. But I have friends who are liberal and friends who are conservative, and they're all supporters of space. And I don't want to see that jeopardized by too much politicization of, of space. So where's the leadership going to come from? I mean, uh, is it you? Uh, is it uh, TVIW? Is, is that a place where this could happen? I, I think, uh, well, I'm glad that you would say, is it you? I mean, I have my opinions. I, I write for blogs. I publish science fiction. I write nonfiction books about why we go to space. But but I'm not sure I am the, the charismatic voice that we had with Von Braun and Sagan and others, right? I mean, they were in a league of their own. I think it's going to have to come – I don't know, Tony. I, I think it's going to have to come up from somewhere. Someone's going to be that voice. And are they going to be the influential because they have made a lot of money, like a lot of these private space development companies have? I, I have high regard for what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. And they're showing leadership in their own way there. Is it going to be through the political process? And we have another John F. Kennedy moment. I don't know. I, I wish I could answer that question. I, I just think that the community, when that moment happens, needs to line up and support them and not fight amongst ourselves. And and I know that'll be hard, but the, the resources are just too limited to do the other to do the others, or we'll be stuck where we are. One of the things that's in the article is a graphic that you present that I thought was really cool. It's sort of a Ben Franklin pro and con, uh, uh, and and you have different categories that you sort of say better, worse. Um, and I, you know, I thought that was a very clarifying chart. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? The... Sure, sure. And and first thing I'll say is anybody out there, right, in fact, most anybody who's who's worked these fields will probably quibble with some entry on my chart. And uh, so I'm just going to stress that, hey, write your own article or reply to mine, because this is just my opinion. But but when I looked at that, I put down the the different destinations we've talked about, the moon, Mars, asteroids, and then using space for energy and resources, and try to kind of give a comparative feel, which is more expensive or which has a higher return than the other. As you go down that list, there are attributes of each of these that weigh into the decision process. One of those, of course, is cost. And and it's not just how much is it going to cost to go do it. It's going to be we want sustained human exploration beyond Leo. So you've got to be concerned about the sustaining cost. How much does it cost to keep it going after you get that started? So if you look at these different destinations, the, the ones that are, in my opinion, the least expensive to do early on um, – are, are probably the moon and asteroids and Mars and space energy and resources have a really large hurdle in terms of investment to get over before you get any kind of sustainment. But once you get there, the cost picture changes. The moon is pretty reasonable for sustainment. Um, asteroids become pretty favorable because you're making money, and as do space energy and resources, because once you've gone over the hump and have your space solar power stations returning energy, you're presumably selling that, right? So you're making money. So the sustaining cost actually looks pretty good after you get in over that big hurdle. Unfortunately, both of those costs kind of penalize Mars up front because it's pretty far away. It's pretty hard to get to, and continuing to get there is going to be expensive. I also put in uh, trip time, and that's closely tied to the next metric, which is also risk, because risk increases, in my opinion, with the longer you're away from home or the harder it is to get from home. And if you look at trip time, well, the moon's three days away. That's pretty close. Mars is two to three year round trips, so that's tough. Asteroids can be anything. There are asteroids we can get to in, in months. There are asteroids that would take years. So that could be all over the map in terms of trip time. And, and space resources, particularly space solar power, is pretty easy because that's Earth orbit. That's hours away, right? And if you look at, at risk, um, things that are closer to home tend to be less risky because you can get home quickly. Things that are far away are more expensive, and that's where Mars also takes a hit. I'll also try to give a, an indication of realistic time to operational. In other words, you know, if we started today and money was not the issue, but just getting the technologies together, how quickly could we do these things? And I would argue that 
uh, the moon, asteroids, and space energy and resources could all be done in about the same length of time. It's the kind of thing you could do in five to 15 years. Uh, five to 10 years. Mars is going to take longer. That would be at the upper end of that scale. So again, it took a penalty, unfortunately, for that, for the Mars group. Now, the science return, however, is where Mars is the clear winner. I think that uh, we're going to learn so much about uh, our own planet by studying in, in depth and up, up close another planet and its history and possible life there that the science return is huge. Uh, and the moon is going to return some science, but not in comparison to what we learned from Mars, because we've been to the moon, it's a lot easier to get to, and we've learned a lot about the moon already. And asteroids, we know a lot about different asteroids, not specific asteroids, but it's, it's going to be good return, but not as plumb as what we get from Mars. And the space energy and resources is not really a science issue, it's a technology issue. So I, I, it really has the lowest science return, but it has other returns that I think are important we could talk about, which is one of those is economic return. And, and for that, I think the clear winner are asteroids and space power. As we talked about earlier, for the resources that come from asteroids and possible money making there as well as uh, space solar power, Mars really isn't in the near term or even the far term really an economic return. It's more of a, of a science return. And, and the moon has a science, has an economic return potentially, but it, it's not as big a return as space solar power and asteroids, in my opinion. Yeah, and unless we find out sure. something that we didn't know before that suddenly becomes extremely valuable economically. Well, that's right. Yeah, and, 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 and you're, that, there could be a subtle hint to the novel I'm writing now, uh, which will come out in a year after this probably, which is uh, uh, about a first encounter that, that happens out there. And, and you never know what you're going to discover when you're exploring the solar system. Let's let's leave it at that. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is the potential long-term payoff to exploration. This is the get-out-of-the-cradle figure of merit. And in my opinion, the moon and space solar power are, are a plus to that, but they're not the, the killer app for the human survival and long-term off-planet exploration. I think the key to that are Mars and the asteroids. I mean, I, we talked about living on Mars and possibly terraforming it. There are a lot of creative ideas about how we can uh, essentially terraform asteroids and make them habitable and, and, and be stepping stones to the outer solar system and, and beyond, really. There are some really neat ideas for future interstellar exploration that involve world ships within asteroids. That's really long-term and far out, but that's what I mean by long-term benefit exploration. If we're talking terraforming, it's a comparable time scale to sending a world ship, in my opinion. Yeah. So that, that summarizes the table you mentioned, and it's all relative. I mean, there's no absolute number to this. It's kind of comparing one against the other, and it's just based on my personal experience and my understanding of, of the problems. Well, um, so leave us with some hope. Um, what uh, what can you tell us about uh, uh, how are we going to come together? What what kind of uh, I mean, you, you obviously you don't have the answers, but um, what's going on? Do you see any currents that are that are leading in the right direction? Oh, absolutely. And and before I jump here, I want to I want to come back to a topic that I said I wanted to cover, and I do cover in the essay. Okay. There's also this this false um, notion that you have space development and exploration is going to happen either by government space agency or through private, and that those groups, in my opinion, need to stop bickering also because I think it just hurts everybody. I, I think it's going to be both. I personally am excited every time I see Blue Origin, x SpaceX, Bigelow, whoever, uh, taking steps toward uh, commercializing space and taking people out there. And I equally applaud and support the development of the Space Launch System for sending huge payloads to Earth orbit and beyond for, for sustained human exploration in deep space and all these robotic missions. And, and I think the future in space exploration is going to be a public and private partnership. It's not one or the other. And we need to get over this false notion that it has to be one or the other, just like we have to get over this, this bickering over the destination. So, you know, put, putting that behind us now and probably maybe enraging some listeners, I don't know, but that's, that's Les's view is get over it, people. We're going to go together and there's a place for both. How are we going to get over it? Is, well, the, the hope is that all these things are happening, quite frankly. It's pretty amazing. I mean, we mentioned up front the private 
uh, Breakthrough Star Shot, looking at how he might actually maybe, with you in some listener's lifetime, sending a probe to Alpha Centauri. Oh, my gosh. In, in my wildest dreams, I didn't think there'd be a possibility of that happening in my lifetime. And it's a long shot, but it's, it's physically possible, and you've got people with money putting effort into it. We're developing the Space Launch System. Which is going to give us the to give us the the capability to put seventy to one hundred and twenty tons of stuff in a single launch into Earth's orbit, which is what you need to go explore the moon, asteroids, or Mars, or to build space solar power stations. And 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 then you go to this private space. You know, we're we're flying inflated habitats on space station, which are going to be turned into to hotels in Earth orbit. You've got commercial space flight trying to uh, get reliable enough to take tourists. And I believe that once we have launch rate going up and we're sending more and more people to space, the price will come down, which will allow more people to go to space. And it's a self-seeding prosperity. So I'm bullish. The only thing I'm not bullish about is where we're going to go with this capability we're developing. And unless we come together and agree on where we want to go, I'm afraid someone will eventually come along and question, should we maintain this capability or not? And then we'll be back where we were when we lost the capability at the end of Apollo. Uh, The private space industry could be killed by regulation, could be killed by international agreements and treaties. Uh, Government exploration of... Uh, moon or Mars or asteroid is subject to the whim of the electorate and what they perceive the people want to do. So there are risks out there. In democracies and the whims of those idiot dictators and in other places. Yeah. You're exactly right. And and even in the private space, you know, all it's going to take is a major accident from one of these commercial providers and a bunch of lawsuits to potentially stifle private space. So these are all risks, but I I don't know that I've seen as much energy and innovation and new capability coming into space in my career or my lifetime as there is now. I really think that this is an opportunity moment. We're at one of those historical cusps, and if we make the right choices and work together in the right way, we might break out of Earth orbit and stay out there. I'm optimistic. I feel like I'm preaching the choir. Amen, brother. (laughs) But that's the way I am. I'm an optimist, and I really look at this as a cusp of history where we've got real possibilities. Well, to read more about this, the article is Mars, Moon, or Bust. It is available for free at Bain.com. They're on the, the front page at the moment. It's also available perpetually at Bain eBooks in the free nonfiction 2016 eBook collection. And uh, I imagine you can go to Les's site and find a link to it at all times as well, which is uh, lesjohnson.com. It's well, actually, there's some cyber squatter on that. It's uh, lesjohnsonauthor.com. That's what I ended up having to get. Lesjohnsonauthor.com. But I try to keep up with. I've got links to all of my books, both my uh, science fiction uh, uh, works with Ben as well as my several popular science books about why we the topics we talked about here today, from solar sails to uh, how to use space resources. And Tony, just a shameless plug for uh, Sky Alert When Satellites Fail. That, that's the book I would recommend people who want to understand how much we depend on space technology for our economy today to read, because I talk about what would happen if we lost it. Mm-hmm. And um, I think when this question comes up of people saying, well, what has space done for us? I think they're speaking in ignorance, and they need to, to and I think your listeners might find that book a way to help, help answer that argument. Well, find the article um, and, and read all of Les's books. The, the article is free. Um, read it, share it around, and, and figure out the question that, that Les poses and save us all. <laughs> Les, uh, thank you very much for being with us and discussing uh, these, these wonderful concepts. Well, Tony, I appreciate your interest and Bain's interest in, in getting word out so that the space advocacy community can hopefully come together. And I'm hoping you. I don't have illusions that my article is going to make it happen, but I think it might help spur the conversation. And that's what I'd like. And I do like to hear from from readers and listeners. And I have a feedback uh, spot on my, my website. And I think uh, Bain 
probably has, I don't know if you have a comment capability on your articles, but if you do, I personally would like to hear back from people because I'm, I'm passionate about this and I like, uh, I like other people's thoughts. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 30 Back on the Campbell, Gardner said nervously. She had a 10 millimeter and a shotgun the Smiths had borrowed when they cleared the Coast Guard cutter. They'd searched the whole ship for infected, but getting back on the ship was giving her flashbacks. The ship was being towed by a submarine, of all things. They'd taken a 24-foot inflatable to make the rendezvous and pick up critical medical supplies. Everything else could wait until it was in place near the liner. It'll be okay, P.O., Seaman Jeff Woodman said. We just get the saline and go. Easy enough, Gardner said. She keyed open the deck hatch, started to step across the combing, then stopped. What the hell? The floor was swarming with black bugs. There were so many, it looked like the deck was black and moving. Oh, gross, Woodman said. Where the hell did they come from? Jesus Christ, Gardner said quietly. What? Woodman asked. She was shining a light into the interior. He craned his head around to look. On the deck was a skeleton. Some of the bugs seemed to be fighting for the last scraps of flesh, but pretty much everything but bone and some scraps of skin and hair were gone. Bugs were even crawling in and out of the eye sockets, cleaning out the brains. Holy crap, Woodman said. I don't want those getting on me. I just figured out what they are. Gardner said, stepping through the hatch after a flash around with her light. Every step caused a crunch, and they won't bite. They stripped that guy to the bone, Woodman said. That's what they do, Gardner said. Bending down and picking up one of the beetles, it skittered along her arm, and she shook it off. They're carrion beetles. Carrion, Woodman said. So they eat people? They eat dead flesh, Gardner said. I'd heard Wolf say he'd seeded the boat. I didn't know it was with these. Wolf did this, Woodman said angrily, to our people? Six of us came off, Woody, Gardner said softly. Ninety-four and twenty-six refugees didn't. You've carried bodies. You know how heavy they are. Now they're not. That's horrible, Woodman said. No, Gardner said flashing her light around. It's efficient, simple, and brutal. It's wolf all over, if you think about it. These things only eat dead flesh. They may get into some of the electronics, but those are mostly thrashed by the infecteds anyway. It cleans the boat out of the main issue, the dead meat on the dead people. If we ever get around to clearing this out, all we have to do is bag the bones. We won't know who's who, Woodman said. Does it matter? Gardner said. There's a big thing. It's called an ossuary in France. All the guys who died in a certain battle in World War I, they buried them, waited for bugs like this to do their work, then dug them back up. All of certain bones are on the left, all the other are on the right, and the skulls are in the middle. She picked up the skull of the former Coast Guard crewman and looked at it as beetles poured out. I don't know who you were, but you were my brother. Gardner said. This way I know I can give you a decent burial. And I will remember you. Now we've got a mission to complete, Woodman. And people waiting on us. Live people. Let the dead bury the dead. Chris hadn't known the boat like the back of his hand. But he'd been able to determine the areas on the other side of several of the doors. 
The one they'd chosen was the lobby area between the, yes, bloody damned skating rink and the even more bloody damned 400-person theater. Steve was starting to think that whoever had conceived this bloody beast had more megalomania than Napoleon. About half the doors were to stairwells to the passenger cabins. Steve was torn between wanting to clear the major areas and concentrate on the passenger cabins. But the way their fire had to be echoing in this ship, the passengers surely knew they were on the way. And he wasn't sure he yet wanted to clear stairwells, possibly filled with zombies. Well open and attract from, not clear, this area, Steve said. Then the theater. Then start on the passenger zones. Roger, sir, Fontana said, shaking his head at the pile of ammo boxes. They'd gotten boats alongside and brought up more people, including some trained seamen who were willing to go into non-zombie areas. With their help, they'd brought all the ammo up onto the deck, well away from the zombie bodies. Steve had also had them bring up some of his little friends, and they had been scattered on the bodies, and the team had gotten a bite to eat and rehydrate. Time to get back to work. The outer doors were already open. Faith checked the door, shook her head, put away the stethoscope, then pulled out the Halligan tool. This time, Fontana and Hooch were on either side of the door, ready to pull. Steve swiped, then pulled back to cover. Faith popped the door, stepped back, and started to put the tool on the deck. But there seemed like time, so she stowed it away in its holster. Steve realized that they'd made a mistake. Not a major one, but a mistake. He either should have had Faith take one of the rifles or have Fontana handle the Halligan. The shotgunners were the first line of defense, with the riflemen backing them. It was a minor point. There was, again, silence and darkness on the far side of the hatch. The foursome lined up in the hatch, and Steve lifted the whistle and blew. Again, there was a guttural howling from the interior. They immediately started to back up and were to the exterior hatch before the first zombie appeared. White, Steve said, taking the shot. I thought you said shotgun in here, Faith complained. It was a clap shot and we're conserving shotgun ammo, Steve said. Rotate for engagement. They continued to back down the deck and stopped at the point they'd planned. And waited. There were sounds from inside the ship, but no zombies appeared. I think they stopped for a snack, Faith said. It was hard to hear with all the gear on their heads. Bloody stupid, Steve said. He lifted the whistle and gave another blast on it. That got some coming around the corner, and he and Fontana began to engage. The crackle of semi-automatic fire started to draw the zombies, but slowly. They came out even more slowly than at the theater, and the two riflemen continued to pick them off as they stumbled, mostly blind, into the light, looking for the source of the sound and thus food. Finally, there were only the growling sounds echoing from the hatch. Faith, Steve said. Don't want you whining. Going pistol, Faith said. She started to reach for her forty-five, then pulled out one of the ten millimeters that they'd gotten off the Coast Guard cutter. They'd left the arms room alone, but any weapons on the deck were considered fair game. Cover me, Hooch. Got it, Hasianic said, following her to the hatch. Faith fired several slow and deliberate shots into the darkness and downward. Then she shifted up and shot twice more. I know this is a more powerful pistol, Faith said, reloading and putting the weapon away, but it really doesn't feel that way, you know? We gonna close these doors? I'm not moving the bodies. Next time, wait till they're clear of the doors then, Hooch said. Cover me. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Christopher Rocchio, Rachel Mintel, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a laser-guided postage stamp sending a love letter to the beautiful oceans of Earth-like planet Wolf 1061C. And the monthly rent from a trailer park with dwellings made of nothing but third-stage shells of Saturn V launch vehicles, with a few conveniences added due to gravity reasserting itself as well as our thanks and praise to Les Johnson, author of Mars, Moon, or Bust, now available to read for free on the Bain.com front page. 
Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 